Welcome to the Covenant Podcast. The Covenant Podcast exists to equip listeners with theological content from a 1689 Baptist perspective. We're on the Man of God Network, brought to you by Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. And in this conversation, I have the privilege to interview my co-host. The subject for our conversation is a friendly critique of theonomy. Uh, This is a subject that we want to talk about because we think it is important. Uh, You'll notice in our conversation that our goal is uh, not to name drop any particular person, except I think our brother is going to be talking about Greg Bonson a little bit. Uh, But we want to talk about this idea, and we want to do so in a cheerful and friendly way. And so I am confident that uh, our brother Dewey has that ability. I know that he is uh, an Irenic brother. And so um, this is not to poke anyone in the eye, but this is just to uh, have a theological discussion on an important doctrine, uh, theonomy. So uh, it's good to be with you, Dewey. And uh, thank you for for joining us to talk about this. And even though uh, our listeners get to hear you nearly every week as you interview other people, uh, it would be nice for you if you would be willing to give us an update on your life and ministry. So would you be willing to share a little bit about uh, where ha- God has you serving right now during this season of your life? Absolutely, brother. And uh, if I can be half as friendly as you uh, as we go through this interview today, uh, I-, I think it'll be a job well done, or at least I hope that it'll be useful to our audience. And um, it's it's good to be back on the other side of the interview for a change. Um as, you, as many of you guys uh, have probably heard from some of our recent episodes, my wife, daughter, and I are currently living in Wichita, Kansas. We moved to Wichita in December of 2022. So if you're listening to this episode like five years from now, that's not December of whatever year you're listening in. Uh, it's December of 2022 when we moved to Wichita. And we moved, uh, we moved up here to Wichita after serving in various ministry contexts in Southeast Texas for about two and a half years. So Uh, We've been here now for about three months. Uh, We're trying to get adjusted to the blustery winter weather that comes with living in Wichita, Kansas. It is a uh, huge adjustment from living in uh, South Texas where the low gets to about 40 or 45. And uh, up here, that's considered a warm day this time of year. So you can imagine that that's been quite the adjustment for us. But um, in terms of my current ministry responsibilities, I'm serving as the pastor of Next Generation and Outreach at Metro East Baptist Church. And in this role, I'm primarily tasked with overseeing our Awana, our youth, and our young adult ministries, as well as our outreach efforts throughout the Wichita Metroplex. So on a practical basis, my current vocation allows me to train the next generation of members within our local church and to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to those in our immediate community. So uh, whether it be abortion clinic outreach, street evangelism at college campuses or in downtown Wichita, Uh, My job is to try to reach out to our community as well as the next generations and and my local church setting that I'm currently serving in. And uh, aside from that, aside from my work and service in the local church, uh, I'm I'm currently working on my uh, D-Ed Men through the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I uh, have completed all the on-campus work requirements for that by God's grace. And at the time of this recording, I'm uh, working on chapter three under the supervision of Dr. Stephen Wellam and Uh, My doctoral thesis is geared towards surveying the New Covenant apologetical implications that stem from a closed canon of Scripture. So uh, my degree emphasis is in Christian worldview and apologetics. I'm very passionate about those subjects. And by God's grace, it's been an absolute joy to be able to work on a research thesis geared towards that, my doctoral studies, in addition to what I'm doing here at Metro East. So um, on top of all that, uh, as as a uh, student and as a pastor, um, things are going well with my wife and my daughter. And uh, as some of you may know who are listening, as Austin knows, uh, I I do enjoy getting to serve as a grader with CBTS and uh, also to write uh, for the CBTS blog as I have opportunities to do so. And uh, this podcast is just such a joy and a blessing to talk with uh, so many gifted men, so many intelligent brothers who God has raised up on a variety of subjects, some of which are very academic in nature, some of which are very practical and pastoral in nature. So uh, over the last couple of years, being involved with Covenant Confessions and CBTS and this this podcast, um, I couldn't be any more thankful for where the Lord has me. 
and uh, look forward to seeing what he does in the years to come. So that's a flyover of what I'm up to uh, in the current season of life. And uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, it seems like I don't ever have any problems staying busy. Uh, so uh, that's what I'm up to these days. Thank you for that update on how the Lord is using you right now. I do uh, assume that you are very busy, but thankful for all that the Lord has entrusted you with and uh, pray that he would keep you and give you strength with all these things that you're doing, including your uh, contribution here at uh, the Covenant Podcast and studying to interview people, <clears throat> excuse me, and for this conversation, studying to uh, be interviewed. And uh, you have done that. And in this conversation, we want to, as I mentioned at the beginning, give a friendly critique of theonomy. And so today's discussion is focused on theonomy. And until now, as I mentioned, we have never done an episode on this subject. And so to help our uh, our conversation get started, could you provide our listeners with an introduction to this term theonomy? What does it mean? Yeah, I think it'd be helpful to give a definition at the outset uh, of the episode. And um, uh, as you've noted, uh, this this is a friendly critique. And, and as I want to note as well, in addition to that, uh, I don't want to come across as uh, presenting myself as the foremost scholar or expert on the subject of theonomy. Um, by God's grace, I have been able to study it uh, pretty significantly over the last year or so, but um, th this is something that I hope will serve as a useful introduction to our listeners, help them dive into this subject at greater length as they have opportunities to explore it further. Um, and, and I just want to make sure that's clear at the outset. This is hopefully just a launching pad or a springboard into uh, further considerations of this very important doctrine. But in any case, what is theonomy? Well, from an etymological standpoint, uh, the English term theonomy comes from two Greek words, theos, meaning God, and namos, meaning law. So theonomy, uh, when, when uh, considering that designation on its uh, etymological uh, standpoint, theonomy, we could simply say is just God's law. So at a very practical level, uh, if you just go off of the word theonomy, then to some degree, every Orthodox Christian can say that they are a theonomist because every true follower of Jesus Christ will hold God's law in the highest esteem. We, we think of passages like Psalm 119.97 and Romans 7.22 uh, as being some of the testimonies of sinners who've been saved by God's sovereign grace and how they view God's law. The psalmist declares, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. And of course, the Apostle Paul states that he joyfully concurs with the law of God in his inner man. So if, if we just define theonomy simply on the basis of its etymology, um, then we, we could just say uh, that this conversation could could come to a close and we could go off uh, and, and, and enjoy the rest of our day. I know it'd be the shortest podcast probably in the history of the Covenant podcast at, at right now, about eight and a half minutes long. Uh, but as we both know, and as I'm sure uh, at least some of our listeners know, defining theonomy goes far beyond analyzing uh, just, just the simple term itself. As it turns out, uh, this is a very complex subject that often requires careful nuance and discussion. Um, when we examine how the label has been championed by self-identifying theonomists over the past half century or so, um, I, I think it becomes quite clear that there is far more to this term than initially meets the eye. And um, there are a plethora of proponents of theonomy. There are a plethora of variations that we can look into uh, for a case study. So it's impossible, really, if, if you just think about theonomy itself, it's impossible to cover everything and everybody that has ever been championed under the label or under the umbrella of theonomy. So um, for our purposes today and seeking to give a definition and seeking to think about theonomy um, and, and offer a friendly critique of the subject, I think that uh, Greg Bonson would, would be a helpful case study to examine. And as I'm sure many theonomists would be willing to agree, uh, arguably the most prominent representative of theonomy is Greg Bonson. For those who don't know who Greg Bonson was, he was a 20th century uh, Orthodox Presbyterian church uh, pastor and theologian and apologist. And um, disagreements on theonomy aside, um, I personally would wager that Greg Bonson was one of the most important and gifted Christian apologists in the 20th century. And I'm, I'm certainly not alone 
in that assessment, even those who disagree with his uh, his theology, even those who disagree with his apologetic methodology would, would say that Bonson was one of the most important Christian apologists, at least in the latter half of the 20th century. So um, this isn't me trying to dunk on Greg Bonson. He was a godly brother, hold him in the highest esteem. Uh, he, he just so happens to be uh, arguably the most prominent and 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 maybe even the the most well versed theonomy that we could study. So, as we think about defining what theonomy is, I believe that Greg Bonson is perhaps the most helpful place to start. And um, as as I mentioned just moments ago, it's going to be Bonson's conception of theonomy that I'm going to interact with throughout the remainder of today's episode. Um, so let me let me give a definition of theonomy through the framework established by the likes of Greg Bonson. Um, according to Bonson, as he articulates in his work, No Other Standard, Theonomy and Its Critics, he, he, he says theonomy uh, can be defined in this way. And this is a direct quote from that work. He says theonomy is objective and biblical in character. It's policy for Old Testament interpretation and for application of the laws found in the Old Testament is that the moral standards revealed by God are all beneficial and continue to be binding unless further revelation teaches otherwise. As a result, the theonomist concludes that most of the judicial or civil laws of the Old Testament, having not been modified or canceled by Scripture later, continue to be binding according to the principle which they teach or illustrate, end quote. So, so in a nutshell, what Bonson is saying there. Uh, theonomy is an ethical system that posits the perpetuity of the old covenant moral and civil or judicial law. So, so theonomy, what, what is theonomy according to Bonson? It is an ethical system that believes that the old covenant moral and civil or judicial laws continue on into the new covenant epoch of redemptive history, which we've been in since it was inaugurated in Christ's blood, Luke twenty two twenty, 20, uh, and other texts that could be cited for that reality. So um, as a reflection of God's holy and immutable character, theonomists who follow Bonson would see the moral and civil ordinances given to theocratic Israel in the Old Covenant as the supreme and unchanging standard for how civil or judicial law should be enforced throughout Gentile nations. So um, maybe I could go even more simple, uh, any, even more simple with a definition. Um in the form of a question, Greg Bonson, in his work, Theonomy and Christian Ethics, he raises this question uh, in that particular uh, publication. He says, does the Old Covenant civil or does the Old Covenant judicial laws, those terms can be used interchangeably, do those laws abide in the New Covenant epic exhaustively? And here's, here's really the dividing line when we think about defining theonomy. Theonomists who follow Bonson would answer the question in the affirmative. The civil and judicial laws of the old covenant, they abide exhaustively in the new covenant. As a direct citation from Bonson's work, Theonomy in Christian Ethics. Now, on the other hand, particular Baptists, the overwhelming majority of those who have subscribed to the historic Reformed confessions of faith, they would answer that question in the negative. And of course, there'd be different reasons for answering that question in the negative, but that's really in a nutshell. Uh, really at the heart of defining theonomy. Theonomy is an ethical system that believes that the moral and civil or judicial laws continue in the new covenant epic of redemptive history. Now, some listening might, uh, especially if those are theonomists listening to this episode, they might say that that's a, a pretty simple uh, way of, of looking at that. But um, I believe when taken on its own terms and, and really trying to get your arms around theonomy at a 30,000 foot level, I think that's some of the key factors we've got to take into account when defining and understanding what Bonson and others have have meant by the terminology uh, theonomy and, and the doctrine that flows from that. And as we're going to look in just a few minutes, um, th there, there are some caveats in that definition that further clarify why they arrive at that at that conclusion. Uh, and we can look at that in detail in just a few minutes. But hopefully that's a a decent way of defining what we mean by theonomy. Yeah, I think that's helpful. Um, this is a little bit more complex than just simply saying uh, theonomy means God's law. I think that you've pointed that out to us. So thank you for your description and definition there, brother. Uh, for most lay people in the pew, as you have uh, prepared for this, the concept of theonomy may not seem like it's that big of a deal, 
uh, especially for those who are unfamiliar with what theonomy is or for those uh, who have heard or are aware of all the complexities that you have just described about theonomy. And so from your perspective, why do you think the average Christian or the pastor of uh, one of Christ's churches should care about theonomy? Well, I, that's a very important question, Austin, and I, I really believe that the answer to that question is directly applicable, not just to our consideration of theonomy, but also to several doctrines that we would deem as being more difficult to understand or uh, that might not be uh, typically at the forefront of a Christian's theological purview. Um, in short to that question, um, I would say pastors, especially pastors, but even lay people should care about theonomy because as Christians, we've been called by God to pursue a true knowledge of his word and to bring our lives into alignment with the instruction contained in his word. That that in and of itself should be motivation to do the very best that we can uh, in as much as we can uh, with, with our mental faculties and uh, with the use of church history and with the use of other helpful resources. We should do everything we can to know God's truth and to apply it to our lives. 2 Timothy 2.15 is especially clarifying on this point. Paul writes in that passage to Timothy, to be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Now notice in, in that passage, Paul doesn't say that a doctrinal issue automatically doesn't matter or that a doctrinal issue isn't relevant to the people of God if it's difficult to understand or if it's just not directly applicable to one's immediate context. He, he doesn't throw that caveat in there. Instead, Paul, he exhorts Timothy, his young protege in the faith, and, and us by extension, he exhorts us to be committed to, to, to thinking about and knowing the full counsel of God's word. So even when it comes to learning what to think about a doctrine like theonomy, Paul's instruction, it's relevant to New Covenant pastors, and it's relevant to New Covenant believers as well. So at the end of the day, Here's really what's at stake when it comes to contemplating theonomy. Uh, if that, which that, I would argue that uh, that passage from Scripture, that exhortation from Scripture, that should be grounds enough to be motivated to learn difficult doctrines. Um, but but on top of that, if I could just lay my chips on the table for a second, when when it comes to contemplating theonomy, here's really what's at stake. If theonomy is an accurate representation of what God's Word teaches— then followers of Jesus Christ are obligated to wholeheartedly embrace it. And conversely, if theonomy is not a consistent framework of understanding biblical ethics, then Christians should ensure they do not espouse what it teaches. It's, it's really that simple. It doesn't matter if, if we're talking about uh, anything from the Trinity to eschatology to, to justification uh, to ecclesiology. Obviously, there's, there's, there's a triage of uh, of what are maybe a little bit more essential to be right on and, and where there's some some fluid areas for disagreement. But at the end of the day, if, if we can deduce from Scripture and, and, and arrive at a conclusion where our consciences are held captive to the Word of God, and we believe that something is what God has declared as truth in His Word or in a general revelation, we, we, have, a, we have a fundamental obligation to embrace it for ourselves. So uh, again, why, why should we care about this? Well, I think that we have to determine, is this biblical or is this unbiblical? Or maybe if, if it's partially biblical, but there's some problems, maybe there's a more consistent approach to understanding Christian ethics uh, and, and to understanding biblical truth. So um, that's another reason why I think it's important for pastors and lay people to, to care about this reality, to, to care about theonomy. Um, in terms of my personal convictions about theonomy, and what I hope to accomplish uh, during our time together today. Um, from my perspective, I believe theonomy is, is biblically untenable uh, when surveyed from a robustly reformed lens. And I use the, 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 the capital R reform to refer to, to not just our Presbyterian brethren, but also to our particular Baptist brethren, to those who are heirs of the Protestant Reformation. And I, I want to provide two foundational arguments for why I believe this to be the case. So my, my first, my first two, uh, arguments for why Christians and why pastors should care about theonomy. Those are pretty foundational, pretty practical pastoral um, arguments. Let me let me flip now to to maybe uh, a, a few more complex and, and well-developed arguments for why I believe this matters and ultimately why I believe um, w when we examine theonomy, we find that it's not the most biblically consistent approach uh, to understanding Christian ethics. 
and uh, core truths that we hold dear as followers of Jesus Christ. So, f- so first argument building uh, from what I've already said, um, when thinking about how Protestants have historically regarded the Old Testament law, um, Reformed Christians have, have have historically, and I would even say uh, o- the overwhelming majority of those who would fall into this category, uh, would divide the law or differentiate the law into three distinct categories. You would have moral commandments, civil commandments, and, uh, or judicial commandments, if we want to use the terminology. Moral commandments, civil or judicial commandments, and ceremonial commandments. Now, the moral commandments, historically, uh, w- within our Reformed tradition, they have primarily been summarized in the Ten Commandments, and they deal with how man is to relate to God and to neighbor. The civil or the judicial commandments were specifically designed to dictate how the nation of Israel was to be governed by those who were entrusted with leadership responsibilities. These laws provided practical instruction regarding how the Israelites should conduct themselves in their legal and civil affairs. And, and lastly, the ceremonial commandments, that, that third division or uh, differentiation within uh, the Old Covenant law, those commandments provided the nation of Israel with a collection of ordinances to govern uh, the nation's religious expression. So within Reformed Orthodoxy, this threefold division of the Mosaic law has pretty much been the standard. But when we think about how theonomists approach the law in the same vein as Bonson, we find that there are some pretty significant objections that they raise to this threefold division. Um, whereas Reformed Christians have historically identified a threefold division of the Old Covenant law, theonomists who are like-minded with Bonson have not done so. They reject the tripartite division of the Old Covenant law. And whereas Reformed Christians have historically affirmed that only the moral commandments of God's law are universally and perpetually binding in the New Covenant epic of redemptive history, Theonomists who follow Bonson's perspective, they affirm that every non-ceremonial law is binding on Christians residing in the New Covenant. Now, that raises a very important question. How did Bonson and, and how have other theonomists gotten here? How, how have they arrived at this particular conclusion from Scripture? Well, um, Ligon Duncan, in a 1994 address on the subject of theonomy, uh, is very helpful on this point. John Frame, as well, in his uh, Christian Ethics textbook, uh, very, very helpful at, at kind of nuancing how Bonson uh, came to the conclusion that a threefold division of the Mosaic Law is not justified biblically or theologically. Um, I want to I want to quote from Duncan on this matter, and in doing so, I believe that we'll see that um, that Bonson he believed that all the Old Covenant laws could ultimately be characterized as either moral or ceremonial. So that in and of itself, any civil or judicial law for Bonson and for theonomists of a similar stripe, as we'll see from Duncan's quote, those figures, they would they would lump together Israel's civil or judicial laws into the category of moral law. So they affirm the the abiding or the per, the perpetual nature of the moral law of God, but they say the ceremonial laws were terminated with the death of Christ. Now listen to how listen to how Duncan further teases this out in that address. You can find this online. Uh, it'll be one of the recommended resources I give um, later on when we, when we talk about that. Uh, but here's a direct quote from Duncan here. Duncan says that theonomy identifies the most significant distinction between old covenant laws as twofold: moral and ceremonial. And, and, and when he says theonomy, he's talking about Bonson, um, but Bonson's uh, particular rendition of theonomy. So theonomy identifies the most significant distinction between Old Covenant laws as twofold, moral and ceremonial. Historically speaking, Duncan says, this means a functional denial of the traditional Reformed threefold division of the law, and alternatively, the espousal of a twofold division, moral and ceremonial. Theologically, it involves an attempt to identify all non-ceremonial Old Covenant law with the moral law in such a way that they constitute a unity. Thus, if one accepts this identification, Duncan concludes, if one accepts this identification and grants that the moral law remains authoritative in the new covenant era, so also must one grant the enduring validity of all other non-ceremonial law, which for Bonson and Theonomus of his stripe, that would include the civil laws or the judicial laws 
proper to old covenant Israel. And that's an end quote. So at bottom, in light of Duncan's assessment here, and I think he's spot on if you read Bonson, um, theonomous and non-theonomous, when considering how the law should be understood, there is a drastically different approach to navigating the relationship between how the law applies and how the law should be understood when viewed through the lens of the old and new covenant relationships. And I believe that this reality alone, I think it should be enough motivation for Christians to better acquaint themselves with what theonomy is and how they can recognize some of the other uh, theological and historical issues that are associated with it. Because we live on this side of the cross, theonomists are going to have a fundamentally different Christian ethic. And in terms of how their ethic plays itself out in a in a private and public sphere, it's going to look a lot different than those who do not subscribe to this particular perspective. So as Christians, we as Christians who desire to know what we believe and why we believe what we believe, we, we need to be aware of, of other uh, viewpoints. We need to make sure that those viewpoints um, are, are not a more biblical viewpoint than ours. And uh, we need to be able to graciously have conversations with those uh, who hold to a sub-biblical or a, fl a flagrantly unbiblical viewpoint on, on uh, subjects like Christian ethics and try to bring them to a more consistent understanding of how God's word speaks to that issue. So that's the first kind of detailed or or further nuanced uh, answer to to the question of why does this matter. Um, my second more developed reason, um, I think it, it's very practical as well. Um, so I guess you could say th three really practical reasons and one uh, more theological reason for why this matters. But um, practically, and, and let this sink in, this is going to sound very bizarre to those who've never done any extensive study of theonomists. But practically, in a desire to see Old Covenant civil or judicial law apply to the New Covenant, theonomists must inevitably endorse the enforcement of capital punishment for the following behavior. And there's more, but these are these are just some of the more prominent um, behaviors that would require execution by the state in a, in a theonomy ethical system, a theonomic ethical system. Murder doesn't sound too bad at the outset, um, but adultery, homosexuality, premarital sex, kidnapping, false prophecy, blasphemy, breaking the Sabbath, and disobedience to parents. Uh, so while there's been debate amongst theonomists as to when and how such laws should be enforced at a macro level in society, some say now, some say in a in a, in a millennial Christianized society, many theonomists are post-millennial, and that might be a different conversation for a different episode. So there are some discussions and debate amongst theonomists as to when those laws should be applied and enforced in society. But I think very practically, why does this matter? Well, um, can we perceive of a context in which it would even be possible in a fallen world for such behaviors to be essentially... Uh, the, the, the consequences of them resulting in capital punishment in a secular Western world. Um, think about our 21st century context in the West. Um, if, if we ever had these principles applied at the state level, um, and if the church is advocating for such practices uh, as well to be, to, to be the result of capital punishment, we're talking about millions of people being executed. And, and when you read the New Testament and we read about our responsibilities as Christians on this side of the cross, um, how how would doing so be the most effective fulfillment of the Great Commission mandate? Uh, we, we would essentially be slaughtering the mission field. Uh, it, it really wouldn't be a, uh, a cogent way of fulfilling Christ's mandate for us to fulfill uh, the Great Commission in our New Covenant context. And then I, I think of passages like 1 Corinthians 5, where incest and adultery is brought to light in the context of a local church. And many of our listeners will be familiar with that passage, especially if they're pastors, um, because this is a key text on church discipline. In that passage, Paul instructs the church to carry out church discipline on the unrepentant parties, the, 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 uh, the incest that was taking place in that context. He calls for um, church discipline. He doesn't call for their execution. Now, out of all the possible scenarios we could imagine, again, very practically here, wouldn't this instance be the perfect time for Paul to instill a practice that is consistent 
with what theonomy has championed. Um, we, we have adultery. We have incest being committed. We don't see we don't see grounds for executing them. We see grounds for church discipline in that in that particular passage. So um, I've heard it said by uh, by some who who have spoken on theonomy uh, that the First Corinthians five situation. Uh, if it, if it doesn't cause the entire system to crumble, it, it definitely should give theonomists uh, just just some pause to reconsider some of the logical implications that stem from their convictions. Um, and and hopefully uh, for, for those who don't hold to, the, to theonomy, to those who are listening and, and are new to this subject or maybe have come into contact with it and don't know what to think about uh, what theonomists espouse, hopefully that just gives uh, at least one tangible proof text to show that um, the, the meat and potatoes of theonomy, it, it doesn't seem to be the most consistent approach to a, to a new covenant Christian ethic in, in light of uh, the, the full counsel of what we find in God's word. So um, I know it's a long-winded explanation as to why this matters, but um, hopefully this will be helpful just to, to jog the thoughts of, of those who are listening to today's episode. Yeah, thank you for this, brother. This, I think, has been helpful for our audience and for, for me to listen to your, uh, your reasons for why the average Christian and pastor should care about theonomy. And at several points there in your answer, it seemed like you were uh, explaining that both the particular Baptists and Reformed Christians, and you said capital, are Reformed. Uh, and I think, what was the definition you gave for the type of Reformed that you were describing? Yeah. Yeah, in, in any any group that that could be deemed rightful heirs of the Protestant Reformation, I know there's some that would that would say, uh, you know, if if you if you don't adhere to a certain ecclesiology, if you don't affirm a certain view of baptism, then you're not reformed. But uh, obviously, there's others who would say that uh, uh, Baptists, particularly the particular or Reformed Baptists, they they stem from the uh, the Reformation heritage. They're they're part of the Reformation family tree. Um, so so I, I I would define reformed under under that particular banner, a more broad definition of, of that, um, of that term. Yeah. So in your definition of reformed and Baptist, uh, you have noted that historically, uh, it has not been the practice to subscribe to theonomy. And so in your opinion, what is a viable Baptist alternative or reformed alternative to theonomy? Well, um, you know, as, as one who, personally believes that the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith is the most robust and biblically faithful confession that that has that has been um, coined in, in, in the uh, in the realm of church history uh, but also more broadly speaking from kind of that broader um, Re- Reformation umbrella um, thinking about our, our Presbyterian brothers and sisters even um, like a group like our Lutheran brothers and sisters and and so on um, I don't think that theonomy is is a consistent approach to a robustly Protestant theology, piety, and practice. But I'll, I'll just speak from a Baptist perspective uh, on this particular note. So as Baptists, thinking about our theology, thinking about um, our, our application of worship and our, and our application of principles of worship to uh, the local church and even to our personal life, and then thinking about how we live out our theological truth on, on a daily level. Um, at bottom, Baptists employ a New Testament or a New Covenant hermeneutical priority to formulate our theological and practical conviction. So um, the, the New Testament, the, the New Covenant, the fullness of God's revelation, that is our interpretive priority to, to formulate or to develop what we believe and how we should live. Um, now, this doesn't mean that we don't see the Old Testament or the Old Covenant as unimportant, right? Romans 15, 4. Uh, these things have been written for our instruction. Um, we, we do glean much insight from the Old Covenant, from the Old Testament. Uh, we're not dispensationalists. We, we believe we preach the Old Testament. We believe the Old Testament uh, proclaims Christ as the telos and at the center of that revelation, as the goal of that revelation. Um, but as Baptists, it is our desire, it is our intention to have doctrine and practice shaped by the instruction that's provided in passages such as Hebrews 8, verses 6 to 13. Um, verse, verses 6 and 13 are, are the two verses I want to read because um, 
Well, I'll, I'll read verse seven as well. Verse verses eight through twelve are, are, are the application of the, um, the the new covenant prophecy that we find in Jeremiah thirty one. Um, but but um, this passage in Hebrews eight, I think, is is one of the most clear passages that should inform our baptistic approach to thinking about theonomy or providing a baptistic way forward. Because um, I know most of our listeners are, are of a Baptist persuasion. But uh, verse 6 of Hebrews 8, Christ has obtained a more excellent ministry to the extent that he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant, referring to the old covenant, uh, had been free of fault, no circumstances would have been sought for a second. And then the, the writer of the Hebrews, um, who, who then cites the the new covenant prophecy there in verses eight and following, he does just that. And then down to verse 13, wrapping up his thoughts and wrapping up that application of the prophecy, the writer says, when he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is about to disappear. Now, why do I, why do I quote that passage? Why do I think it's so significant to the to the discussion we're having. Well, I believe at, at, at bottom, at, at the most foundational level, when we think about the inauguration, the, inaugura- the inauguration of the new covenant, what it means and what its significance is, the old covenant and every law pertaining to the old covenant was terminated when the new covenant was inaugurated by Christ. And as such, that's true. And I believe it's true. Tom Hicks has done wonderful work here. Um, Sam Waldron has also done wonderful work as well. We'll talk about some of their resources momentarily. Um, Sam Renahan, another guy who's done great work on covenant theology. Um, but if that's true, if the old covenant and every law pertaining thereto has been terminated with the inauguration, inauguration of the new covenant, that means that our basis for affirming the abiding nature of the moral laws it's been it's been grounded in the fact that those laws have been written on the conscience of every image bearer of God and that they are a reflection of God's unchangeable character we in other words though the old covenant the moral laws in the old covenant though they reflect God's unchangeable character though they reflect the abiding stipulations that God holds man accountable to our basis for affirming their pep- perpetuity, thinking about a passage like Romans 2, 14 through 16, it's ultimately grounded in the fact that those principles, those ordinances, they have been transcribed on the conscience of every human being that's ever lived. So we don't need, we, we don't even need to affirm uh, their perpetuity or their abiding nature on the basis of the old covenant itself. We can We can go back to creation to do so. And then when we think about the civil or judicial laws and we think about the ceremonial laws that govern Old Covenant Israel, we can say they're no longer binding on the New Covenant people of God because the civil or judicial laws, they were done away with when Israel as a theocratic nation uh, was terminated. That nation, the nation of Israel, its existence was directly tied to its relationship in covenant with God. And when that covenant ceased, their status as a theocratic nation ceased as well. So the civil or judicial laws that governed their affairs as a nation, we don't have to see that as being perpetual or abiding in the new covenant. And then the ceremonial laws, of course, they were done away with when Christ um, when Christ poured out his blood for his people on the cross, bearing God's wrath in the place of every person who would ever believe. So the ceremonial is done away through the death of Christ. The civil and judicial laws are done away with when Israel ceases to exist as a theocratic nation before the living God. And the moral laws abide not because necessarily of their place in the old covenant law, though they certainly are um, a part of the old covenant law and they are a reflection of God's character. But on the basis of passages like Romans 2, 14 through 16, we can say that those laws are present in the conscience of every human being at creation. And that pre-fallen Adam would have had a knowledge of those truths and of his requirements before God by virtue of having concreted knowledge of God at the time of his creation. Of course, Lane Tipton um, did a seminar at CBTS where I'm sure he exhausted that truth um, quite quite substantially. But in any case, um, as those residing in the New Covenant era, uh, 
of redemptive history. Our priority as believers, speaking as a Baptist, our priority as believers should not be to seek the application of old covenant civil laws in the church or the installation of old covenant judicial laws in society. That that shouldn't be our our, our uh, hill to die on. There are great truths and great principles to learn from those laws, but under no circumstances are we bound to them, nor should we impose them upon secular or Gentile nations. Rather, from a Baptistic perspective, I believe that the ultimate priority for New Covenant Christians is outlined in Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, the Great Commission mandate to make disciples of all nations, to baptize them, those who come to faith, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that Jesus commanded. So, so for Baptists, for, for those who live on this side of the cross, what is our way forward? Well, I believe that the way forward is to focus our religious expression on bearing witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ through our words and through our deeds. We should concern ourselves with living quiet and respectable lives within our secular society. We should bear witness to the reality of our faith as God grants us opportunities to do so. We should be involved as much as we can in the public square, vying for uh, for reformation, for the common good. Um, but we should do all of those things under the banner that it's not our job or our responsibility to Christianize society or to transform the world through the application or imposition of civil or judicial laws that were uh, proper to Old Covenant Israel for a particular time and for a particular uh, purpose. Now, that's just my personal opinion. Um, I think it's a viable Baptist alternative to theonomy. Um, John Frame, who, who's not a Baptist, um, and of course, I, I do take exception to some of Frame's views on theology proper and Christology, uh, but, but Frame's work, The Doctrine of the Christian Life, A Theology of Lordship, a tremendous book on Christian ethics. And um, I think Frame hits the nail right on the head, uh, even as a Presbyterian, another another um, denomination or, or another Christian tradition that would fall under the umbrella, that capital R umbrella reformed. Um, he says this about the task of the church in the new covenant. I think it's very, very uh, helpful. I think it's consistent with the, um, the way forward that I've provided uh, on this point. So Frame says the following, and this is a direct quote from his work, The Doctrine of the Christian Life, A Theology of Lordship. Frame says, quote, the task of the church is set forth in the Great Commission, which involves not only baptizing, but also discipling. God has not given the sword to the church. Our only weapon is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And the Word of God speaks comprehensively to all aspects of human life. The Great Commission does not restrict the church to preaching a simple gospel, the way to escape divine judgment. Rather, the preaching of the church presents to the world a way of life that transforms everything, end quote. So what, what Frame is saying here is that if the church will just be the church, if we'll be salt and light in a fallen world, if, we're, if we'll preach the full counsel of God's word, if we will live out biblical truths in the midst of a pagan and unregenerate society— we're doing our part to be faithful to what the new covenant uh, is instructing believers to walk in, even as we strive to be faithful to the Great Commission mandate given by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I believe that's a helpful way forward to keep uh, in, in our minds as Baptists, as we think about um, theonomy and as we think about uh, maybe a, a more biblically consistent way of navigating life in a fallen world on this side of the cross and until Jesus returns. Good stuff, brother. Good stuff. And uh, thank you for your thoughts here today. And thank you for uh, taking your time to not only explain theonomy and why people should care about it, but uh, a Baptistic and reformed alternative to theonomy. Well, we've been talking with Dewey Doval about our subject, a friendly critique of theonomy. And before we draw our conversation to a close, brother, do you have any recommended resources for, or final words of encouragement that you'd like to leave to our audience? Thank you, Austin. Um, just just so you know, it, it really is a joy to um, be on this podcast, to, to labor alongside you and Jimmy when he's available, um, to, to interview the, the men who we have on this show, and just to see the wonderful work that God's doing through um, so many faithful brothers, 
um, not just of the 1689 theological uh, tradition, which which is the tradition that we would align ourselves with, but also other um, faithful traditions as well. And um, love CBTS, uh, love the work that God's doing um, uh, with this seminary and with the ministry of Sam Waldron and those involved. So I, I pray God allows me to continue to serve alongside you men um, for, for many, many years. But um, all that to say, in, in terms of our discussion for today and recommended resources, I want to provide a few that touch on um, the popular level, maybe more of an introductory level, and then those that would get a little bit more academically inclined. So um, I'm sure we can uh, either post links to some of these resources um, in, the, in the description box on YouTube or whatever, or I mean, some of this you can just literally Google, just if you're listening and something stands out to you, you can you can Google the name and you'll, you'll find it on Amazon or you'll find it online. But starting with the popular level, um, it just if you go to the CBTS website, Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary website, you'll find some phenomenal blog posts on theonomy uh, that were authored by Dr. Tom Hicks and Dr. Sam Waldron. Um, personally, I've benefited greatly from the work that both of these men have produced on theonomy. Um, really, even though I say those are popular level works, they are very robust, very helpful, very well articulated and researched. And um, I would say start there. I mean, wonderful, wonderful um, resources that you can glean from. Brandon Adams is another man uh, who, who has done a lot of work on theonomy on his personal blog. You can just Google Brandon Adams theonomy. Uh, you'll find a lot of good resources. Uh, Adams does a good job of going to the original sources um, some of his blogs are very, very long, and for good reason, he wants to accurately represent those who he's engaging with. Um, so if, you, if you're wanting a good, um, popular level introduction to theonomy, uh, any of those men and the blogs they've written on the subject are helpful places to start. They've also been on various podcasts to discuss theonomy. So again, Google their names. Sure, you'll be able to find uh, plenty to dive into uh, for those who are either new to studying theonomy or those who are seeking to understand why it's problematic for those of a Baptistic or a confessionally reformed persuasion. Um, in terms of the more academic treatments of theonomy that you could turn to, John Frame's book, I mentioned it and quoted from it moments ago, uh, The Doctrine of the Christian Life, A Theology of Lordship. Uh, that volume, though it, it's not narrowly focused on theonomy, there are dozens of pages, um, at, at least 20 pages or so, that are devoted to theonomy. So although it's a, a broad uh, approach to Christian ethics and surveying issues relevant uh, to how Christians should live out their faith, um, he really gets into the weeds of theonomy. And oddly enough, um, Bonson is also his main focal point uh, in the main substance of the literature. Now, uh, he does have an appendix where he looks at Rudis Rushduni's view of theonomy and Christian ethics, and he gets into some of those weeds. Uh, Rushduni is another prominent theonomist as well. Uh, but Bonson, in the main body of the text, is, is Frame's focal point uh, when he deals with uh, popular conceptions of theonomy. So um, I'll, I'm, again, very indebted to Frame. A lot of what I said uh, you're going to see reiterated in Frame's work. Uh, Vern Poitras, uh, a colleague of John Frame, he wrote a book, The Shadow of Christ and the Law of Moses, very helpful, um, kind of a, a, a blend, you could say, a hybrid between an academic and popular level treatment. And of course, uh, W. Robert Godfrey's work, Theonomy, a Reformed Critique, uh, does provide a, a more academic uh, level treatment of theonomy. And then lastly, for a more historic perspective on theonomy, um, th this was, I think, a couple of years ago now when it was originally published, but Crawford Gribben. Um, he published a book titled Survival and Resistance in Evangelical America, Christian Reconstruction in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, Reform Forum, uh, for some of our listeners who may be familiar with them, they did an interview with Gribben on his book uh, on, on a Christ the Center episode. So you can look up that uh, if you just want to get a, a big picture overview of uh, why he wrote the book and what he's trying to do. But essentially, he's looking at the historical development uh, and progression of theonomy uh, in the northwestern part of uh, the United States and, and looking at some of the uh, not just theological issues relevant to that, but even cultural and sociological issues relevant to its development. So I uh, would, would recommend Gribben's work as well. And again, you can find that through Google uh, and, and get it to you uh, via Amazon. And then, and then lastly, uh, just want to give credit where credit's due. Um, I always try, I'm not perfect here, but, uh, if you've read my work on dispensationalism uh, or any of my work, I, I really try the best that I can, uh, 
to be faithful and accurately representing the original sources that I'm engaging with. Um, so if you really want to get into theonomy uh, and, and look at the original sources to see what theonomists themselves have said when taken at their own terms, um, start with Bonson. Start with his work on theonomy, and then maybe you can transition from him to to Rush Dooney or Gary North or others who've written on theonomy. But a couple helpful places to start with Bonson would be No Other Standard, Theonomy and Its Critics, and then Theonomy and Christian Ethics. Those are those are two of, of Bonson's uh, more elaborate treatments of theonomy. I think they're understandable treatments, and, and I think you'll get a good idea of what he tries to argue uh, in, in terms of his views on uh, the applying old covenant law uh, to new covenant Christian life and practice. So uh, as I said at the beginning of this show, I'm by no means the final say on theonomy. So please do your homework. Don't don't just sit back and take my word uh, on the subject of theonomy without investigating these matters on your own time. Be a Berean. Um, I would just encourage you to take it upon yourself to read broadly on the subject and uh, consider for yourself. Consider for yourself if this ethical system is compatible with the Word of God. My contention is if you're faithful to do your homework on theonomy, you're going to find uh, that the errors presented in the context of this podcast and in other places, that that they are real errors. And um, I, I think you'll be able to see why we have some legitimate concerns about the biblical basis for theonomy in the first place. And, and these concerns have been raised by minds far more sophisticated than my own. So um Listen to this podcast, look at those resources, look at those other uh, recommended uh, places that I've mentioned, whether it be blogs or podcasts or these books, and I trust you'll be helped greatly in your efforts to better understand theonomy. Well, our brother has left us with the final words, so we will uh, link to the show notes some of the things that he mentioned and wish you grace and peace. God bless. Thank you.